Well, 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 well. Welcome along to another happy special episode of Irreverent. It is, of course, Easter now. The gloom of Lent is over and we are all very happy, relatively speaking, of course. It's me, the Reverend J.A. Franklin, curate in the Church of England. And of course, as always, my good friend, T.J. Pelham. Tom, how are you doing today? Uh, it's, it's great. The weather's changed. I mean, how, how wonderful was Easter Day? Um, well, it's always wonderful, but it's especially wonderful, I think, when it is sunny, because yes. it's like creation is rejoicing alongside you. And then, um, and then brother. And, uh, and so I think um, I think that's always great. And had a wonderful uh, Sunday roast um, Ooh, in the nice garden with my brother, who I've not seen in months. Was and it lamb? It was lamb, Jamie. We 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 sort of that sort of Paschal symbolism. Killed the fatted calf. <laughs> uh, and my mother did a fantastic um, roast lamb. And it was just uh, it was just really lovely to sit there and to celebrate. Um, in, in sort of wholeheartedly. So that was really good. Um, Great. And uh, here we are now, Easter week, a joyful week. Yes. Um, and uh, so we're glad to be here, Jamie. The sun is shining, it's warm outside. Um, you know, uh, next week I'm going shopping. You know, I can get my beard cut. This is, yeah. The time has nearly come, Jamie, between uh, this, this podcast and the next, I will be shorn. I'm so grateful. I'm just so grateful to the government for giving us the right to go shopping. Thank you, government. Thank you. Hey, Tom, I had a great, I had a great Easter Sunday. We had um, significantly more people at church than we'd had, we've had ever since I've been here. So our congregation is growing despite the lockdown. People want to come to church and they come to us because we're open. The, lots of people who aren't even Catholics or they're not into the high church thing. They're sort of evangelicals, but they come to us anyway, just because we're open and we're, we're, uh, we're preaching the words. We're celebrating the sacraments. We are gathering together as Christians and people, people need it and they want it. We've, we've even had a few people who listen to the podcast who live in the area who've actually come and visited our church. And there were a couple there on Sunday, which was wonderful. wonderful. I got a wonderful letter from, um, two fans of our show um it's great to have this it's a fan mail really um so thank you very much for that um it's it's up on our um it's up on our sideboard um and uh you know it's really encouraging to 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 have that sort of um, feedback um amazing uh, so uh very enterprising to find my address, find the address of the church I work. It's not actually that hard to do, as, as my, my wife and I discovered. So, <laughs> but uh, I mean, yeah, I've, so. Had, I've had people emailing my church uh, inbox, which I it's, it's fine. I don't mind at all. I've had them ringing my office phone. I don't know how they got the number, but again, that's absolutely fine. In fact, that reminds me, I better unplug it because it, you know, I, no one used to ever phone me, um, <laughs> but now they do. So I'm just unplugging it now. You can see if you're a YouTube uh, uh, user. Yeah. Um, the only person, the only person who, well, I get, I get two types of phone call on my, um, on my house phone, Jamie. Um, one of them is from my wife because um, she's tried calling my mobile and for whatever reason I haven't picked it up, and she, she knows I often leave it on silent in the wrong room. Uh, the other, the other thing is, is a sort of voice from Amazon um, that keeps telling me that my Amazon bills are overdue. Yeah. Um, is that which? Yeah. Uh, Tom, you failed to pay for everything you ever buy, which well, I, I, comes from Amazon. I'm reasonably certain that I have, in fact, paid for everything. So I think it's a, a scammer. Um, probably, but probably. Yeah, I think I so. Mean, it's a good bet, though. It, it, they ring you up and say, oh, Tom, you've bought something from Amazon. You think, yeah, basically everything I've ever bought in the last six months or, or year is, is from Amazon. I mean, the, the kind of stuff we get from Amazon now, I mean, it's just getting crazy, you know, like, like clothes and socks and um, you know, seed for the grass, you know, just anything you want. You just go on Amazon. You just, you know, it's a, it's amazing, isn't it? Um, I mean, it's a bit. Uh, it's a. It's a bit. I think. Uh, I think something like um, twenty thousand high street shops are closing down uh, over the over these two years, aren't they? They reckon, yeah. which is um, it's, it's know, almost like result. it's almost like Tom that big businesses like Amazon have some kind of stake in lockdown and that it benefits them in some way and that they might, love it. Yeah. they might be levering political pressure in order to keep it going. It's almost like something like that might be happening. It, it, it wouldn't be, I mean, the cynic w wouldn't be surprised, would he? Um, I, I mean, uh, whether, whether they have or haven't, um, certainly they've been enjoying it. Um, yeah. And they, have almost, no, they certainly have no, no interest in um, 
in changing the status quo, even if they're not actively lobbying for it. So, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it's almost like the largest wealth transfer in the history of humanity, isn't it? From from thousands or potentially hundreds of thousands of small to medium sized businesses to a handful of massive multinational corporations like Facebook and, and Amazon and, and Google and Apple. You know, it's yeah. it's it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Um, it's, it's it's tragic. But yes, no, it's yeah. It's awful, it's, I mean, you know, in all seriousness, it's absolutely awful for these people whose businesses yeah. have been utterly destroyed yeah. by these by these and, and, and not just those people who you know. I mean, those people who were on. In, in sort of customer facing roles in, in these high, high street outlets, they might not own the business, but it, you know, I mean, I mean effectively they're, they, their jobs have been outsourced to warehouses, which are not customer facing. Yeah. And they're, they're sort of, I mean, I'm sure people, you know, some people have fun in warehouses, I think, um, uh, but. Um, I'm sure I used to you've had some fun in warehouses. Tom. Actually, actually, Jamie, I have. Um, I used to work for an audiobook company, and uh, they um, they had a Did big you read warehouse. The were you one Sorry? of the voices? Were you one of the voices of the audiobooks? No, I, I edited them. I edited them. All oh, right, you didn't do the actual voiceovers. No, no, we got we got quite serious actors in to do that. Um, I think my favourite one was was, was um, uh, what's his name? Um, the chap who played Manuel in um, in Forty Towers. Um, oh yeah, J- Jonathan Sachs. Is it Jonathan Sachs? Yeah. No, it's not Jonathan no. Sachs. He's, no, he's the, he's the uh, chief rabbi. The chief rabbi. Um, <laughs> uh, ex-chief rabbi. Um, I can't remember his name. Uh, yeah, I know who you mean. It's, it's, yeah, I, can't, I don't want to guess because I'll get it wrong. And You'll get it wrong. Anyway, he was lovely. Um, really, really fantastic guy. Um, really um, gentle heart. Um, he, read, he was reading uh, this enormous history of the Jewish people, wow. which is also very interesting. Um, yeah, uh, which we we're, were recording. Unfortunately, that company went bust. <laughs> yeah. so, I don't know what happened to it. Never um, mind. Never mind. Um, Tom, whilst this is extremely interesting, I think we need to say a massive thank you to people who have sponsored us on Patreon. The re- the response has been beyond my expectations by by a long way i thought we'd get maybe sort of three or four people we've got currently 35 patrons and the patreon's been up for six days so i mean it's amazing because the financial support we're receiving opens up all sorts of opportunities for us and we haven't actually put those into practice yet but we will do very shortly but we're we just we're so grateful for that but also i think the sort of emotional and psychological boost of having people sign up to the patreon is is amazing and uh, I must say as well that I'm just learning how to use Patreon. So um, I intend to release um, the recordings as soon as we've done them, just so the patrons get something a little bit extra, you know, to get the episodes one or two days early, depending on when we record them. But as yet, I've not actually had time to work out that technology. But one of the great things about Patreon is that you can send direct messages to patrons. And so I've done that a couple of times this week. It's a great forum just to just to sort of bounce bounce ideas off people in a in a more sort of focused way. Um, so it is one of the real benefits of going on Patreon that it is like a kind of small community. And I'm already sort of seeing how that might work. So um, it is worth joining and obviously the more people support us the the greater range we have the greater opportunity we have to enhance the podcast and perhaps do other things as well so if you'd like to support us financially on patreon you can just go to www.patreon.com forward slash irreverence so www.patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash irreverent and you can sponsor us for as little as three pounds a month which when you think about it probably is that's probably like kind of one of those hot chocolates with whipped cream that you got you get in in cafe nero uh, you know i think you'd be lucky to get that for three pounds jamie i think um that. it's cheaper than one of those really rich hot chocolates in in, in cafe nero and uh, it makes a huge difference and you can join that sort of smaller more focused community on on patreon as well and um, so we'd love to have more sponsors Uh, on there i want to give shout outs to people who have sponsored us but 35 names is too much so i'm going to do about 12 names a week so just quickly we want to say and i'm not going to say the second name because i I don't know whether these people want to be named fully but thank you so much to uh, mia david w recovered liberal i'm assuming that's not this person's real name stephen s jane a linda m erin b andrew s kevin f fiona w james m and dawn d those were our first how many is that? About 12 Patreons. That, those are our first 12 Patreons. We've got several others we need to thank as well, but it's amazing to have this support. I genuinely feel emotionally, I feel emotional when I, when I talk about it, Tom. I don't know where that's coming through. I genuinely feel really emotional at the, at the support that we've been getting from people. Um, 
huge. It's great. I think it really helps, it's going to help us expand this ministry and um, and you know get it. Because I know some people have said that my my sound has been poor, and we're working on that um, and, and various other things that will um, help us sort of. Um, yeah, Tom, we're 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 a number one Christian podcast, right? We need to up our game here. And I'm recording on a thirty-three pound headset that I bought so that I didn't irritate people at Cudston. <laughs> I was playing games, um, uh, but um, you know, from humble roots, um, I, uh, I, I so so yeah, I've just. I'm overwhelmed, really. I didn't think when Jamie said, "Oh, I set up a patron um, to help us sort of bet, to, to, to cover some of the costs." I thought, "Well, you know, we'll get twenty quid, and it'll help us towards server costs or something." But the, you know, thank you ever so much. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's honestly the the sky is the limit. I feel in terms of this, in terms of what we're able to do, not just with the podcast, but I think that there are other things, that other avenues that we can we could perhaps look into as well. Because um, I won't talk about this now, but I, we're getting so many emails with people who like we were talking about last week who who just who just need you know they need some support and help and uh, i'm not really sure what we can do at the moment but certainly um certainly the the patreon community i think is a good way of, of people connecting and bouncing ideas around and stuff like that so between that and the financial support we're receiving and also the way our ratings are going up i really think there's a great opportunity for this podcast to keep growing and growing and growing perhaps contribute something really significant to the church and to people's lives our last episode uh, we grew another something like another 400 downloads on the audio last week so it was, a, it was our it was our biggest episode ever by 400 downloads the youtube video has been watched uh, one and a half thousand times so this is these numbers are are really growing exponentially unlike something else we've we've talked about quite a lot for the last year um so thank you so much and again a massive welcome to all our to our listeners uh, thank you so much for emailing us as we say we get so many emails i do try and respond to them as they come in if i can but i can't respond to everyone i do read them all take them all really seriously and i, I pray for people who, who email me uh, as much as i possibly can and uh, we do really appreciate that if you'd like to send us an email it's irreverentpod at gmail.com and as i say we do read those emails and uh, you may if you email in become um the emailer of the week and we have a very, very good email of the week this week, which I'm very, very excited about. Oh, that sounds so, good. I always look forward to these. I always look forward to these. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. But this one, this one is really good. This is really excellent. nice. Excellent. But we should, we should talk, we should move from us to, 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 to where we're going, shouldn't we, Jamie? Because we should, uh, we we should, should not be egotistical. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so Tom, shall we talk, what should we talk about? Should we talk about the Monday press conference that we have? Uh, this do, we, uh, do we have to, Jamie? Yeah. And, <laughs> I think we have to. I mean, it's, it was just one of the, the Easter Monday is a day of joy uh, in the church. Uh, huh. um, and um, Boris Johnson and his stooges decided to step out and, um, and cast a shadow, a long shadow over the next couple of years. Um, a dark think, and demonic shadow. <laughs> Um, so, so I mean, it's, it's what kind of we've, we've predicted this really, um, and, we, and we really need to go back and, and see how prof prophetic we've been, because I think we've been a number of times. <laughs> I, think you, I think you said we're going to stop talking about ourselves. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and I'm fairly how, certain. Let's talk about how right we've been for so long. Uh, well, it's always nice. It's always nice to gloat. No, because I'm, I'm so, and we're not the only people who said these things. To be fair, it's, to be honest, it's as in inevitable as the as a train coming around the track. You know. Um, yes. The, the idea that that, um, that 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 we get to the 21st of June and uh, you know that being glacially slow as it is, um, and we've moaned about that already plenty of times, but um, and then and then everything stopping, you know, uh, was was mooted by Boris Johnson. Uh, you know, that's when legislation will will cease to control our lives in this way. We will we'll yeah. return to being a liberal democracy under the common law and not as Matt Hancock said this time last year, a sort of Napoleonic code, um, which tells us what we can do yeah. rather than what we can't. Um, and, uh, and then it turns out, actually, uh, they're not going to do that. Yeah. Um, what a surprise. What a surprise. Um, so, so am I right in thinking? So, Tom, I didn't watch it, obviously, because I, I, I view it as a kind of demonic assault on my soul. All <laughs> Um, so it, as I understand it, basically... We had, we had Daniel, bless him, texting us because neither Jamie nor I could bear to watch it. So yeah, Daniel... <laughs> but in all seriousness, Tom, I think it is part of their tactic to scare people as much as possible. And that's why I don't watch any of this stuff because I think they're literally trying to 
they're trying to control people through fear. And I, I do, I do find it quite scary it. when I watch these people because they are so powerful and they are also so clearly, um, clearly uh, morally vacuous and and interested in perpetuating this this absolute inhuman farce uh, as much as they possibly can. So should we should we just talk about what they actually said because I think we should, yeah. we should get it right. I think um, what they've said is that unless um, various uh, social distancing and face masks and other uh, non-specified NPIs, non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions are continued uh, yeah. post that date, there will be another large resurgence of the virus in the autumn. Um, they suggested that it would take another year of, of mandatory face masks, mandatory social distancing, uh, sort of government um, campaigns and... Um, you know, and, and one can only imagine the other things they might sort of tack into this. You, you could imagine being under the rule of six, for example, you know, uh, yeah. uh, or, um, uh, you know, limited numbers for um, for parties indoors or, or something like that. And, um, you know, I could tack, you can easily see them continuing with those should they feel necessary and then the, for another year. And apparently in a year, that's going to be fine. I don't know why it's going to be not fine in, in, in four months and in a year, suddenly it'll be fine again. Uh, but because yeah. it, it won't be, will it? It'll get to a year's time and they'll say, well, we need to keep them going, actually. Um, and you end up in this perpetual cycle of fear and, uh, and fairly useless interventions. Um, totally, useless. Uh, totally useless interventions. Now, Tom, can I ask you a question? Right? Yeah. What do you think the answer to this question is? Why, why, are, they, why are they doing this? Just simply, why are they doing this? Well, I, th I think, um, to be honest, Jamie, I think they've, they've terrified themselves um, and they've terrified um, uh, the public and they've terrified the press, or at least the press have, haven't, haven't had them to account. So I personally think this is just a, you know, an inevitable logic. They think that it is their actions that have saved us thus far. And that, the, and the assumptions they they made back a year ago in their first, over a year ago in their first models, um, are still valid. So they think that it's only their um, interventions that have stopped there being a, a plague of, 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 of proportions of which would have been devastating to society. Um, and the consequences of this is that um, that they they can't let it go because to let it go um, would would be to to acknowledge that actually um, you know they're not in control anymore right um, that they're not uh, you know the scientists in particular you know they, they are quite enjoying one suspects having this sort of level of control um yeah uh they certainly have been allowed to have this sort of level of control for far too long and the longer they can keep the fear going the longer they can produce um nonsensical uh models that that, that um that predict doom and gloom uh the longer they have their the levers of power yeah so, um, like the, yeah so sorry just let me come in there i mean i think what you're describing is like the best case scenario basically and, and you may you may be right i mean it's hard to say i mean it's impossible to say isn't it for us because we don't know what's going on in, in these people's minds um and i suspect that there is a lot of truth in what you're saying i think the and this may not even contradict what you've just said but i think the worst case scenario is that these people are lying and then they know they're lying on some level at least and that they're going to continue to lie because really what they want to do is they want to maintain these levels of control over society and they actually want to augment them and this is where the whole nonsensical um, farce of, of vaccine passports comes in and and you know we have to be we have to be very um, discerning because there is a kind of 1984 style thing here going on where they tell us something and then they promise that something's going to happen as a result of it and then they just change the narrative and they expect us all to forget it so for we, 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 yeah. months they were telling us that the vaccine was going to sort, sort this all out and it was going to change absolutely everything there was a there was yeah. a two page spread in the spectator which was basically a completely uncritical um interview with matt hancock i think it was in january where my he, freedom is going to yeah. cry freedom wasn't and he the banner headline said i've got it here in my office before i cancelled my subscription the banner headline said we're going to have a great summer right now are we gonna have a great summer now that we're still gonna to have to wear masks and social distance 
Um, I don't think so. And this vaccine, what they did is they changed the narrative. They, they were telling us the vaccine, the vaccine, the vaccine, the vaccine. And then what they said is, oh no, now there are variants. Now the vaccine isn't going to work. And, and with some of these vaccines, I heard Boris said, they, they are, uh, sorry, some of these variants, they are potentially unvaccinable, which I didn't even know was a word because I thought the vaccine could do absolutely everything. I thought the vaccine was our savior and it was going to deliver us. And now we're being told that we're going to have to live with these non-pharmaceutical interventions basically forever. I mean, so yeah, there's changing this narrative. They're doing the same thing over and over again. They come out with a narrative. They make you, they make you carry on with it because you think it's going to end, and then they come up with something else which perpetuates it. Yeah, and and this thing has the capacity to keep going forever. Sorry, carry on. Uh, no, absolutely, Jamie. And 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 I, I, just this week, and this, we've got this news about also released in the press conference. The, the two lateral flow tests we can do each week, and, and now they oh, want us to goodness. test ourselves every is week. Is and he sending these things to our houses is that yeah, what he suggested? I, I have no idea how they're going to how they're going to hand them out, Jamie. But um, Matt Hancock has said, you know, this is our route to freedom. And you think, but the, uh, hang on a second. Three months ago, our route to freedom was having a vaccine. Now our route to freedom is being tested and presumably having a vaccine. And, and, and then we hear that Boris Johnson is making his roadmap um, sort of dependent upon testing and vaccine, neither of which are in the roadmap. The roadmap simply, uh, you know, was looking at cases. Um, and you, you kind of, you know, how, how much can they do this? Well, the answer is until people stop. Yeah. Um, and my... my my dad is, is very hopeful that, you know, that actually people will just start ignoring this. Yeah. Um, and that, I think, is probably our only way out, Jamie. Our, our only way out is if people start ignoring um, the government. Yeah, um, I mean, I do, I do think at some stage there, needs, there will probably need to be some kind of massive or disobedience if this is, if this is going to stop. Well, I mean, I think, I mean, personally, Jamie, I'm going to take my mask off and I do wear a mask to go into shops uh, because, you know, if people ask me to wear a mask, I'll go into, the, into there and, and wear a mask if it's only for a short amount of time. I will take my mask off for the last time after June the 21st and whether there's legislation or not going on it, I will not put it back on again. Well, um, and that's one thing that I think everyone needs to do. Um, I wouldn't wear it now, Tom. Just don't wear it. I, I, I consider masks to be yeah. a visible sign of submission to this, what I, what I regard as a demonic ideology now, which is, which is casting a dark power over our lives. Do you know something I saw this week, which I thought was particularly asinine and, and wicked and joyless, was this idea that at weddings, when a father of the bride walks her down the aisle he has to social distance from her can you think of anything that's more inhumane and joyless than the idea that the father of the bride has to social distance from his own daughter i've on her wedding day down the aisle. i find that to be absolutely disgusting and abhorrent i can't think of anything less british than that idea. These people, these technocrats who we did not vote for, who are controlling our lives, are, you know, the, what they represent is absolutely antithetical to everything that this country has ever stood for. And I find it, I find it distasteful to the extreme. And they, you know, this is the thing I find so outrageous. These people, Chris Whitty and Patrick Valance, they've got no right to control our lives. They have not been democratically elected. They, they should not be up there in their press conferences next to Boris Johnson, calling the shots, holding their own press conference, uh, press conferences apart, apart from the government. I mean, who do they think they are, these people? Neil Ferguson is another one. You know, this man who broke his own lockdown rules to have an affair in the middle of the first lockdown because he thinks he can create rules that everyone else has to follow and he doesn't have to follow them. And now he's back in this nerve tag committee. I mean, it's absolutely outrageous, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the fact that Neil Ferguson is back again is, 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 is ridiculous. Um, I, I believe, you know, he, he was only away for a month or two. It was sort of a revolving <laughs> door, really. Um, he was, about, sort of he was back on again. about two weeks while he was investigated by the police, and then he was back on a new committee that was set up like, specifically so he could run it. Yeah. Um, so it's... it's um, I, <laughs> It's, it's an absurd way of running the country, and, and it's, it's a sort of a real sign that, that I think um, that I think that Boris Johnson and his government have actually lost control, um, yeah. lost control of what they need to be doing. And and, um, and and the sort of job of the government is is to take information, uh, to analyse it, to assess it, to to work out um, whether the, what what the what they propose is legal, whether it's proportionate. Um, uh, whether it's you know in keeping with the long tradition of democracy and freedom that we've got, and, and to apply a an answer, and um, they tried to do that um, 
for a bit, to be fair. Um, you know, there were a few weeks where Boris Johnson was saying, no, we're, we're, we're a liberal democracy. We're not going to lock down. Uh, we're going to take this on the chin, I believe he said, back in, uh, back in February. And then it was then it was sudden capitulation to to them, and they haven't really got back since. And I, I think it came with his illness. Actually, so we're, we're about a year off his illness, his illness now, aren't we? His, well, his illness came after the, after the first lockdown. I mean, Tom, oh, cool. I've got to tell you, I'm pretty skeptical about this whole thing. I, I I just I you know I don't know what's going on, but I think this whole thing is basically a deception. Now, I don't. I'm not saying I don't believe in COVID. I do believe it's real, but I think. You know, I think what's going on is so manifestly nothing to do with COVID now that I just, I, I, I just completely reject yeah. anything, anything to do with this. Any of these measures, I think these measures are completely unnecessary. I think they're ineffective. I think they're immoral and evil. And um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just done with everything, every single aspect of it. None of it has any legitimacy whatsoever. The only legitimacy that there was in any of it, potentially, which I don't even accept, is the idea of protecting the NHS for three weeks, which I don't accept. I don't think we should have done that. Uh, had a lockdown for that purpose. I think there were other ways, but that was the only that was the only thing that made any rational sense. That was well over a year ago. It was supposed to be for three weeks. This is absolute nonsense. I'm not living like this. I'm not accepting it. I'm going back to the way I used to live before. I don't give a damn about this government and anything they say about COVID. It's, it's lost all legitimacy. And this is the other thing as well, right? This vaccine passport idea. This is um, this is complete nonsense this makes no sense it's completely unnecessary it's immoral and there is no way that i am acquiescing to this in any way particularly in the church and this is where i just like to plug uh, the letter that we've um, we've been involved in in uh, writing and promoting this week which we've written with uh, william philip who is a minister in Scotland who has, um, who was part of the group of church leaders that successfully challenged the Scottish government with their illegal closure of churches, which has been established as a precedent now, which is really, really good news. William Philip um, has collaborated with us in writing this letter, which is addressed to the prime minister. It's gonna to go to his office. It's gonna to go to all MPs and first ministers. And it is making this point about vaccine passports. That it doesn't make any sense to have vaccine passports because if the vaccines work, then people are protected regardless of whether or not there are unvaccinated people around. Also, as seems to be the case, vaccines don't seem to stop infection or transmission. So you can't say that people who have been vaccinated are, are not spreading the virus because they very well could be. Vaccine passports are immoral because they are going to create a two-tier society, a medical apartheid, which will create effectively an underclass of undesirable people. The third point the letter makes is that as church leaders and leaders of Christian organisations, which is um, the letter is open uh, to sign for people like that, church leaders and leaders of Christian organisations. We will never, ever implement this in our churches and we will never implement this in our Christian organisations. We will never do this because this would be a denial of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is for everyone not just for people who have been vaccinated. It's a universal call to repentance and faith in Christ. And there is no way, no way that I am ever, ever going to turn anyone away from a church for not being vaccinated or for not having any other medical treatment. No way. So if you are a Christian leader or the leader of a Christian organization, please go to our website, www dot vaccine passport letter dot wordpress dot com and sign that letter we'll put it on the show notes i'll say it again www dot vaccine passport letter dot wordpress dot com we've already got 400 signatures on there it's been up for about a day go on there we want to get hundreds more we ideally get into the thousands and then we're going to send this to the prime minister we're going to send it to labor labor mps Lib Dem mps all mps because we want them to know that if they try and push this through and apply it to us they're going to have a hell of a fight because we're not going to put up with it we are not putting up with it and I, I think that's a really good thing to do. And, and obviously, right to if you are not a church leader, then you know talk to your ch talk to your church leader, um, mm. and write to your MP yourself. Um, speak to your local pubs and bars, and you know write to them as well. Tell them how unimpressed you would be with, it, with them with them acquiescing to this. I I rather enjoyed Jamie. I don't know if you've seen in the news um, a number of the pilot schemes for the vaccine passports. Um, and a number of clubs uh, were signed up for this. Um, have actually pulled out. Um, they, they, was, they were simply, when they signed up for it, it wasn't a pilot scheme for a vaccine certification or for a passport. It was a, um, simply a safe reopening um, pilot. You know, it wasn't, yeah. there was no, no such thing on the horizon. When this was sprung in onto them, they, they, they've actually pulled out of, the, out of the opening, which I think is, is good on them um, because uh, you know, this, is, this, is not, this is not something which is, which is compatible with being a liberal democracy. We, we cannot 
tolerate this. And I think um, I think it looks like um, there's going to be a significant amount of um, uh, fuss in Parliament if Boris tries to pass legislation about this, uh, which is good. It's about yes. time Parliament found a backbone. Yes. Um, I believe that Keir Starmer has even made his mind up on something, which is, I think, a new record. Um, <laughs> but he'll probably change it tomorrow. Uh, yeah. You know, it's about time. At least the Lib Dems have, have come out strongly. I mean, to be, so they've had a really spotted uh, kind of um, uh, time as, uh, as, a, as being Liberal Democrats in this time because, because they've not really stood up for um, democracy or liberalism. Uh, but they rarely do. But this time, at least Ed Davey has uh, done those two things. Yeah. Um, uh, and, um, and obviously added to the, to the 35 odd um, backbenchers of the Conservative Party who are, who are very disgruntled. Um, uh, it could be a, 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 a bridge too far for Boris Johnson. Yeah, well, let's hope so. We have to do everything we can. Very apparently, very uh, apparently, Tim Farron is very sympathetic uh, to our letter and he's going he's gonna to be raising it, which is, which is great Sweet. news. But yeah, just to emphasize that point, sorry, Tom, I did that in the context of a rant a bit. If you are, just to be absolutely clear, if you're, the, if you're the leader, if you're any kind of leader in a church or a Christian organization, you don't have to be the lead um, pastor or whatever, you can, you can be any type of leader, go to our webpage, www.vaccinepassportletter.wordpress.com and fill in the form and then your, your name will be put on the, the signatories list uh, manually. If you, are, if you don't fit that criteria, um, that's, you can still help us. Um, please take the website address, get the website address and send it to your church leaders or any le leaders of Christian organizations that you, are, you know of and, and, and tell them or at least ask them to consider signing this letter. And, you know, the more people do this, the better. I mean, I think if it lands on people's desk multiple times, that's absolutely fine. They need to know that something's going on. So if you're, if you're um, not a, a leader as such um, who can sign this letter, and even if you are, you can send it to other leaders. And then the other thing to do is write to your MP and tell them you're never, ever going to accept vaccine passport. We want to absolutely deluge our MPs with letters. We want them to have no rest from little pings in their inbox with another person writing to say how illiberal and unacceptable, unnecessary and immoral this idea is. So write your MP. If you don't know how to write your MP, if you've never done it before, go to write to them.com, write to them.com, you stick your postcode in and they will get, they will tell you who your MP is. They'll give you a form, which you can actually, you can actually do your, your email right there on the website and click send. It takes a, a few minutes. Very, very simple. They work. I think they work for us as well is another one that does a similar thing. Yeah. They yeah. work for us. Yeah, um, they work for us or write to them.com. Very, very good websites. Get on there, deluge your MP with, with letters and tell them, tell them to vote against any vote in parliament for vaccine passports. And I think, I think it's very important, especially um, with a, um, with a government in such a high majority, especially those in conservative, um, yes. in conservative wards to talk to their MP uh, and tell them in no uncertain terms how upset they are. And, and you know, to be honest, um, how like unlikely you might be to vote for them, whether, whether it's true or not, uh, how unlikely you might be to vote for them if they, if they, if they vote for this sort of legislation. Um, you know, until the government starts fearing for its electoral position, they, they will continue to, 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 to act uh, with impunity. So it's time that we started, uh, you know, taking... Um, it's high time, Tom. It's well, high more time. Than time. I, mean, I, I, I think my MP's given up responding. I mean, to be fair, my MP, Sir Robert Sims, is a, a good man. He has been one of the consistent um, COVID um, kind of sense. Uh, what's the, what do they call it? The COVID response party or something. Um, oh, the COVID recovery group. That's the COVID recovery group. He's, he's been a member of that from the start, uh, along with Charles, Sir Charles Walker and various other stalwarts of the um, sceptical scene. Um, but even so, you know, if you've got a, if you've got a, a, a MP like Sir Charles Walker, just write to him and say thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because, Absolutely. And encourage, encourage your MPs if they're voting the right way. But for these MPs who are not opposing this, you know, uh, they, they have to be made aware of what they're going to be voting for or even abstaining from. This has the potential to turn our country into a de facto apartheid state. And it could, it could not be more serious. I find it astonishing how people are treating this kind of concern as, as though it's melodramatic. I'm not going to say who it was, but we sent our letter to somebody who's quite high profile, a high profile uh, Roman Catholic, and he, he described it as melodramatic. And I just, I cannot understand that. I mean, is the situation we're living in not serious enough? I mean, how can you call something melodramatic? 
when literally our whole way of life is being transfigured by this te technocratic autocracy who are planning on bringing vaccine passports to stop people from participating in public life. I mean, this is, this is what I don't understand. At the beginning of this, right? At the beginning of this, I, I, I remember when the first lockdown came in and I sent a message to a friend of mine and it was actually, Tom, you were actually in this group, I remember on, on Facebook and, there, and I expressed concern and, and this person said, no, it'd be all right because the English are belligerent, right? The English are belligerent and they understand freedom. Well, um, at the time I found that quite comforting, but actually over the past year, I've seen that the English now are largely speaking not belligerent and they're willing to acquiesce and allow their, their God-given and hard-fought-for freedoms to be taken away from them at the, at, the, at the drop of a hat, basically, because of the threat of, as Sinetra Gupta put it, a third-rate pandemic. They've allowed themselves to be terrified into submission to this godless, joyless, inhumane regime. <laughs> I'm absolutely, Jamie. I mean, I think it's 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 not their fault necessarily. In as much as you know, you can't expect everyone to to um to understand what's going on. But what, what we need is is a press that, that actually yeah. um, engages with um with with every side of, of, of this story. I mean, you know, they ask they ask the awkward questions. The questions like, what, why is there no apocalypse in Florida? Why why is there no apocalypse in in Texas now they've reopened yeah. four weeks? Um, yeah. Why, yes. um, why are the North and South Dakotas, uh, why, why, why are they so similar yeah. in their epidemic with, with such different um, uh, sort of interventions? Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, th these are questions. Um, why are all of the bad <laughs> the variants coming out of, out of places that are locked down hard, Jamie? I mean, it's, yeah. it's that, well, with the exception of the Brazilian variant, uh, and obviously it's, it's always yeah, hard. Tom, to be honest with you, to be honest with you, I don't really believe in any of these variants. I think well, no, I mean, they're basically made up. Viruses do change, Jamie, and, and it's quite possible yeah, viruses, change. Viruses change, but I, I, I was listening to uh, Mike Uden's inter interesting interview with James Dellingpole this week, and mm -hmm. he said the variant, the mutation of the variant is something like 3% 3, 3 of the original, um, the original virus. Yeah. So that would, be that would be the equivalent of the, me taking the baseball cap that I'm wearing now uh, and turning it round so that the peak is at the back of my head and expecting you not to recognise me as the vaccine. So that, that's, you know, he's, he's the former, he's the former uh, vice president of Pfizer. And that's, that's what he's saying. Yeah. These variants are negligible in terms of these yeah. vaccines. So I, mean, I, th I think... Sorry, carry on. No, I, I completely agree. And I think that every study so far has borne that out, it's to save one, which was rather underpowered. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, you know, these variants, they're coming out of, of lockdown countries, aren't they? They're coming out of Kent in the middle of a lockdown. They're coming out of California. They're coming out of, you know, if it, I've said this before, if it was actually a matter of, you know, restricting transmission was necessary to stop variants, you'd be expecting the dangerous variants that are coming out of India, yeah. you know, out of yeah. Africa, um, yeah. not out of, not out of lockdown states. Um, yeah. Where, where, you know, and, and it's quite possible. And I know Dr. John Lee, who's on the heart um, with the um, recovery group, group, recovery team, um, has, has moved that actually it's quite possible that our adoption of, of hard uh, non pharmaceutical uh, interventions would actually encourage nastier, yeah. um, more transmissible lines of COVID because yeah. um, it would kill off the, the, the safer ones. Yeah. Anyway. That's, I mean, that's speculation. Yeah. And, and it's, it, will make, it will make the ones which are more transmissible um, survive because people will be for, separated from each other. Um, oh, by the way, Tom, we've had a we've had a, um, an invite invitation to, to join Heart. By the way, and I have actually uh, replied and said said I will. And I think I forwarded you the email as well. Yes, yeah, um, I think that's a really good um, thing. Um, yeah, sorry, but one thing I was just wanted to come back on with you there. Yeah, I mean, I I accept. I think the the press are. Um, they have a high degree of responsibility for what's happened because they've, they have utterly failed and they've betrayed uh, the, the British public by um, acquiescing to the, to the government. Um, but, and I don't mean in any way to, to blame the people per se. I think personally, I think the middle class are, you know, uh, are the ones who are, who are basically allowing this narrative to, to perpetuate itself. Um, I think a lot of working class people tend to be far, far more sceptical. I had a brilliant uh, conversation with a uh, Sainsbury's delivery driver yesterday. Just, just so easy to, to, um, to, to talk about this stuff with, with just ordinary working people who, who I come well, across. I mean, um, so I I just, just hang on one second. So I, just, I don't want to be heard to be saying that I blame ordinary people. I don't blame ordinary people. I blame people who are powerful and who could do something about this, yeah. who are doing absolutely nothing because it's, it, it would inconvenience themselves to do so. Sorry, go ahead. 
No, no I mean, I mean the, 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 the key thing to remember is that we're, we're not arguing about petty things here. You know, we're not, we're not arguing over small differences. We're not arguing, uh, you know, nowhere in the world has come anywhere near the, pre, the, the amount of deaths that, 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 that were allowed for um, and, uh, under the pre-pandemic preparedness, pre preparedness plan. Yeah. Um, which was, you know, nowhere, nowhere's come anywhere near. Um, regardless of interventions, different interventions, nowhere's come anywhere near. We're, we're, we're talking, um, you know, the, the, the basic assumptions made by our government and by, our, um, by the modelers and by things have, have not been shown to come true, univer you know, yeah. universally. And, um, and so to be enthralled to them, to be, to be held captive by them is, is sickening. And it's really, um, it is the press's job to, to question that. Luckily, there have been a couple of sceptical articles in the Telegraph and the Spectator recently, which is nice, but um, they're sort of balanced by, by some awful stuff in the Independent. But hey, um, uh, you know, um, I think uh, until the public throw off the reins, then we're going to be in this. Um, and so, you know, we're back, we're back to where we were a couple of weeks ago. We were saying, you know, trust God and trust the working class, um, because I think that's where it will start. Um, yeah, amen. Um, Amen, brother. Should we hmm. should we talk about what happened on Good Friday? Because I think it was. Uh, oh, I think it's a, this is this is another um, absolute disgrace what happened. So uh, we've got a good article here by our, our, our new friend William Philip, who wrote on uh, lockdown skeptics about this. Um, and we'll put this on the show notes. He writes: Why will the police allow Muslim protesters to gather outside Batley Grammar School, but not Christians in a church on Good Friday? Right. I was shocked, but sadly not surprised when my phone pinged with WhatsApp message pass with a WhatsApp message passing on a video of police breaking up the Good Friday church service of a church in South London. Video embedded in a tweet by Giles Fraser showed a policeman standing at the lectern announcing that this gathering is unfortunately unlawful under the coronavirus legislations we have currently. You're not allowed to meet inside with this many people under law. He then told the congregation to go home immediately, threatening them with 200 pound fines and arrest. Um, the tweet, this is Giles Fraser's tweet, uh, which included the video, asked, what have we come to? Um, the police inventing new laws, it seems. It's certainly not unlawful for churches to be gathering for congregational worship anywhere in the UK. This has been so in most of the country since last July, apart from a few brief periods of closure. In Scotland, where I minister, it was unlawful until a judge in Scotland's highest court struck down the Scottish government's law on the 24th of March. For following a successful judicial review in a ruling which sets up a very important precedent for the whole of the UK, Lord Braid accused the Scottish government of having merely paid lip service to Article 9 of the European, European Convention of Human Rights and failing to accord it the importance with uh, which such a fundamental rights uh, deserve. It appears Wandsworth police have fallen into the same trap, both disregarding the fundamental right to worship and overreaching themselves in the most insensitive of ways on the most significant weekends of the Christian year. Did you see this video, Tom? I'm, I'm sure you've seen it. Yes. <laughs> uh, sorry, I, thought, I was waiting to see if you're going to show me it. Um, yeah, no, okay. I, I, have, I have seen the video. Um, it's, it's, know, absolutely it, it's absolutely unbelievable, isn't it? it? Do you know, I mean, there's so many things that the police have done wrong here. Um, and, and you kind of, you kind of think, um, where do we even start unpicking what was going through their heads? I mean, if, even if there was um, sort of uh, social distancing guidelines being broken, it, it, it must be said those are a matter not of law, but of guidelines. Yeah. And they're a matter of, uh, for, not of, you know, uh, not, not there for a police matter. Um, but, you know, sort of rolling back, you know, there aren't any maximum numbers allowed in churches. There, there's no such thing. It has to be risk assessed, doesn't it? I think it has to be risk assessed. Yeah. But um, as long as, you know, but rolling all the way back to, to thinking, you know, at what point did they think it was OK to storm into a church and shut down a service when the, you know, when, when you think, that the appropriate thing was surely if they have a concern to speak to the priest before or after the service, um, ideally after the service, um, to talk it through. Um, that, that would be policing by consent, which is probably, you know, an alien uh, kind of um, thing. But actually, that's, you know, that's what the police should do. Then they're not there to storm in and shut down things, services, yeah. unless there's a risk at that point to, to sort of uh, uh, to, to life and limb, so to speak, which there isn't, uh, you know. Um, but you know what, what? What were they thinking? Yeah, I mean, you know, 
they're just i mean i i've got no idea tom but i mean I think one of the, I, I saw Peter Hitchens tweet um, said something like, you know, this this, um, you know, farce in uh, wherever it was in South London today demonstrates to us that we no longer live in a, in a Christian country. And I, I think that that's 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 definitely true. If this culture was still in any way remotely Christian, you would have thought that these police might have thought, well, you know, today is actually Good Friday, which in some ways is the holiest day of the Christian year. I think you could probably say it is the holiest day of the Christian year. You know, it's the day when when. Um, we we celebrate and participate in the death of our lord jesus on on the cross you know we we um we uh we worship christ as our as our crucified savior you know we creep creep to the cross and you know various different people do that in different ways but you know there are all these very sort of sacred and holy holy things that we do and for the police to not show any kind of tact, any kind of care and consideration, I think it does show just how profoundly godless and secularised this culture is now. Um, William Philip writes, our police today will reverently sink to their knees before violent, statue-destroying BLM protesters, but they will threaten to arrest and fine those bowing the knee before Jesus Christ on Good Friday. And I, I, think that just, I think that just about sums it up. You know, one of the things he said, I don't know whether I quoted it earlier, but one of the things the policeman said was, I appreciate that you would like to worship. You know, I mean, how, how dare he? It's not a question of we would like to worship. It's firstly, it's our right under the European Convention of Human Rights to worship. It's not a question of a preference. It's our right. And secondly, there is a law which is higher than the law of this nation. And it's the law of God. You know, we <laughs> yeah. have to worship. And yeah, the, I mean, you know, as if the police can come in and say, well, I appreciate you'd like to worship, but yeah. we're actually saying no. Yeah, and I, I mean, it, as if they had any sort of legal power to do that anyway, because it's quite, you know, he was making up laws as he goes along, um, which is, you know, pretty much the definition of a police state. Um, yeah. Whatever the police say, it goes. But there, there, there's an interesting uh, sort of, because um, on the same day, I happen to see, I don't know if you've seen this, uh, Jamie, but Polish uh, Canadian priest. Yeah, 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 it was brilliant. Uh, Chasing, uh, chasing police out of his church, um, yeah. shouting, <laughs> shout, shouting at them. And it's, it's a great little video. Um, and and you know, there's a, there's a well, can only it's much harder in the middle of a service, I suspect, to do that. Um, uh, should we, Tom? But, should we have a quick? Should we have a little listen to it? Yeah, let's little, have a little uh, listen. Can you can you play it? Uh, yeah, play let it, me just. Um, I've got it's uh, the the thing I've got has an advert on it, so let's just wait. Let's just wait for the advert, and then we'll listen to it. I mean, it goes on for such a long time, which is part of the reason it's so brilliant. Here we go. Let's listen. Immediately get out. Get you hear it? Out of this property immediately. Out. I don't want to hear anything. Out of this property immediately. I don't want to hear a word. Out. Out. Out of this property immediately until. You come back with a warrant. Out. There are six Out. six masked Out. policemen in the. Uh... Out. Out. <laughs> Out of this property. Of course, part of the problem, Jamie, is that um, actually our, our leg the legislation that the government had brought in had kind of completely removed the need for, for warrants. Uh, in, 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 they're not there as long as the police want to they can, they can at one point the police could use any reasonable force <laughs> that they thought reasonable to enter properties and yeah. to, to chase out um covid law breaking I mean, uh, this... any reasonable force i mean you know they could shoot someone and they say as long as they think it's reasonable uh you know it's it's just um it's, it, you know the, the the whole concept of property rights and whole concept i mean you know, where does one start with quite how ridiculous the the um the legal system we're currently working out uh working under is i mean it actually gets bigger did you know this jamie we get more legislation every time we get freer yeah because yeah. because they're defining what we can do the more we can do the more legislation they have to have. yeah yeah um, so let's, every... listen, let's listen to this last bit tom this bit's good ready let's, let's listen to this last bit you're not welcome here nazis are not welcome here Gestapo is not welcome here. Do not come back, you Nazi psychopaths. Yeah, Apple, I mean, terrible, sick, <laughs> evil people. Yeah. Intimidating people in a church during the Passover. You Gestapo, Nazi, communist, fascists. Well, See, he, that, he... that, my friend, that, my friend, <clears throat> is a voice of somebody who understands the threat that the state poses to yeah. religion and free, free life and association. That's somebody who understands the severity of the situation. And there are probably people thinking, oh, well, he was going over the top. But, 
you know, this is, I, I find that absolutely brilliant and inspirational and, and well done him. You yeah. know, and I think, you know, if, if a, I don't know really what I do, but if a policeman tried to invade a church service that I was part of, I would hope that I would respond in a similar way, you know, because this is absolutely outrageous. Police invading our churches. How just, dare they? How yeah. dare they? I mean, it's been commented on quite strongly before, but you know, in, in medieval common law, um, ch the church was a place of sanctuary from the from the uh, from the violence of the state, um, yeah. which was something which uh, you know, um, uh, which which was sacrosanct. You know, you could yeah. you could go there um, for um, to, to as, as a fugitive from the state, as a place of yeah. asylum uh, yeah. and peace. Um, now. Uh, how different we are now um, with, the, with the jackboots stomping up the aisle. Um, it's, it's, it's saddening. Um, and, you know, I've, I've been thinking about this, how the state has, has pushed its way into our churches, and not because they're, they're there already, aren't they? But with, the, with, the, um, with the masks and, and how they render a church service down into a sort of, uh, you know, the congregation into a binary of COVID and non-COVID, you know, looking distrustfully, peering at each other, around these uh, around these rags um yeah just it's just alarming isn't it the state has already come in and you know where where would where is the the embracing of the leper or, or the, the that um that used to be the case you know do we need to have um do we need to reintroduce the uh, the leper holes um we spoke about that last week i was, yeah. I was, I was you know I, one suggestion i've heard is if churches ever do um do uh start vaccinating uh, requiring covid vaccination certification or passports um you know, two people I, I I know very well said, "Well, we will we'll stand outside and ring bells, shouting unclean until yeah. we're allowed in." You know, and we'll do that every week without um yeah. without end. And I think you know, yeah, that's what this is. What this is, isn't it? We're, we're being divided into clean and unclean. It's it's a it's a it's a, it's a yeah, it's a, it's a return to um to those sort of um pharisaical rules. We've said this before. Yeah. You know, um. It's a, what it is, Tom, is a demonic inversion of the gospel, and it's an attempt to undermine the church's ministry. Um, I think the um, I think the the wearing of masks, the you know ridiculous um, gu guidance around not singing, uh, the social distancing, the even even the withdrawal of the chalice. I think this is this has all been an attempt to soften the church up for the this assault which is coming which is to do with vaccine passports i think what they want us to think is that well this is just you know we've been doing all these measures and it's just one more thing but actually this will constitute a, an unambiguous break with the gospel with those other things i accept you know there may be a way a way where you can still minister and you can still have integrity and I, I, well i say there may be i think there probably is um, I don't. I don't wear a mask. I know. I know that some people do, but that for me is a red line. But anyway, I, I think you can probably just about accept this to a degree and and still be a faithful minister. However, this is now an attempt. They they're trying to they're trying to gradually move it closer and closer, and and then the, this step will be the step where actually uh, what you're doing is anath anathema. And it is a repudiation of whatever orders, whatever oath, whatever ministry uh, promises that you made to preach the gospel, to invite all people to hear the message of salvation. This will be a contradiction of that. And this is actually, again, I mean, I don't want to talk about the Nazis all the time, but this is what the Nazis did with the churches in 1930s. They tried to soften them up with, with rules and, and guidelines, which were which were unreasonable, but they were unreasonable to the extent that people could accept them to a degree. And then they got harsher and harsher and harsher. And then I think I mentioned last week, the Aryan paragraph, which basically banned uh, Jews from being ministers in Christian churches and eventually banned Jews from Christian churches altogether. We're not a million miles away from that. You know, um, I, I think there's a difference clearly between people who are unvaccinated and people who are Jewish. But essentially, we're talking about the same kind of thing. We're talking about banning unvaccinated people from our churches. And in the words of Karl Barth, nine, nine, nine. never, <laughs> never going to happen. And if churches, if churches implement this, they will be apostate. I, I, I've, got no, I've got no problem with saying this. I've, I've never heard anything like this. You know, if we, if church, if church pastors, how can you stand up in a pulpit and preach the gospel? You know, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not, have, should not perish but have eternal life. You cannot say that with integrity if you ban 
unvaccinated people from your churches. So no, I, I agree. I mean, I, and I don't think the church will go there, though. I, I'm alarmed at how, I mean, I, I'm finding um, a sort of wry amusement, actually, at the moment, Jamie. Um, it's something we haven't discussed yet, actually, because we, we talked a number of weeks back about um, the bishop's uh, video about how safe the vaccine was. You know, go and get vaccinated is safe. And um, of course, in the news recently is, is actually, uh, oops, um, uh, is it safe? I mean, yes, in some ways you could say it's safe. Um, as we spoke then, I think, um, you know, there's, there's... It's not safe to get a blood clot and die from it, though, is it? It doesn't, it's not safe to get a blood clot and die from it. And, um, and even though that's very rare, so is dying from COVID if you are under 40, you know, 50, mm -hmm. you know, to the point where the risk levels are comparable. Um, and this is what they never say. Of course they don't say. You know, and it's the reason now that it looks like, it looks likely that, that, um, that the AstraZeneca vaccine is not going to be given, even in the UK, um, to, to, um, to women under the age of 30, or indeed anyone, or, or it's going to be offered only to people over that. Because uh, under, the, under that age, um, the risk is, too, is higher than, than catching COVID. Which um, it's, it's almost, that, well, I, I believe that it's, it's, it's way higher to people who are well over 30, since basically hardly anyone over, under the age of, what, 70 and who's, who's healthy has died of COVID. So, you know, yeah. you're talking about people who are totally healthy. They're not, under, they're not in any risk of dying from COVID whatsoever. And they have a vaccine and the vaccine kills them, right? That, yeah. that ends their life. And, and, and this is saying that this is safe, you know. And this is, you know, and this is exactly why, for one thing, uh, well, politicians shouldn't be saying this vaccine is safe and effective without, you know, because it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's only for a doctor to say that, you know. Um, uh, but, but bishops doubly shouldn't be handing out medical advice about vaccines they know nothing about. They, you know, there may be even worse side effects going down the road. There may not be, but there may be. You there, know, are, there, are, there aren't many worse side effects than death. Well, no, I know, but I mean, is in, is in terms of uh, in terms of how um, yeah, the amount of people you know, who are affected, the amount of people who are affected, and yeah. you know, this is exactly what we were saying about you know whether the church should really be careful about releasing propaganda for the for the vaccination campaign. Um, and, and you know, and and it's not the church is not making enough noise about this coercion, um, yeah. uh, and and it is a moral and ethical issue that needs to be dealt with. Yeah. Vaccines, okay, vaccines are good. I would say they are good. There are problems with vac some vaccines because they are um, manufactured using unethical methods. We've talked about those before, and and the AstraZeneca vaccine is one of those. There are other ones as well. Um, but on the whole, vaccination using inactivated virus cells has been a force for good in this world. Uh, but that does not mean that you should compel people. Um, in fact, uh, you know, it's, it absolutely means you shouldn't, because in the end, the only person you can say what is good for you uh, or good for good for any one person is that person, uh, with, with with obvious um, some yeah. some obvious uh, restrictions on that if you are unable to make those choices, uh, and they're, and they're, you know they're, they're dealt with with due severity. Um, but, you know, regardless of all that, um, you cannot have a church telling people to take a medical procedure. You can't do it. And they shouldn't have ever done it. They should have thought long before being filmed saying, I've had my vaccine and it's safe. You know, um, actually, uh, this, is, this is wrong. Uh, this is not our area of expertise. Yeah. Now, now that for a number of people, actually, for, for everyone under the age of I don't know, they're saying 30, let's say 30 as well for the sake of argument, everyone on the age of 30, huge chunk of the population is not safe. It's not, in fact, it's, in fact, it's less safe uh, than, than COVID. Um, yeah. and, and that is um, a serious issue. Yeah. I mean, Tom, just to go back to this thing you're saying, right, about vaccines being a force for good in the world. Now, look, I'm not, I'm not disputing that. Frankly, I don't really know what I think about vaccines. But what I would say is the way it appears to lots and lots of people, and, uh, and again, I would say lots of people I know who are more sort of working class type people, is if vaccines are so great, why does the government, uh, why is the government trying to coerce people into taking them? Why don't they just explain clearly what the risk um, ratio is and why, why it's so good to take vaccines and why if vaccines are so great are the vaccine companies um why do they have legal indemnity for, well, for i mean i mean i think they've got they've got legal indemnity because the government have uh, authorized these under emergency use no, no but there's but they have legal indemnity every, anyway don't they wasn't there an act no, in 1984 I, which gives them legal indemnity um in terms I, of side effects from vaccines i don't know about that jamie but um, certainly um I mean, if i was a if i was a drug company and the government said i want to use your product 
before before you finished your trials on it. Uh, and the first thing I would say is, okay, but that's on you, not on us. You know. Yeah. Well, uh, maybe maybe our listenership can help us out uh, with that because I'm sure that there's a, I'm sure that there's a, an act which was passed in 1984 which gives uh, drug quite companies. possible. I I don't know, but you know, I, that, no. that's. The fact is, is this is this is big business, right? This is capitalism, and this is yeah. the forces. This is market forces which are driving this. These people don't necessarily care about your health. What they care about is the bottom line. This is a business, and it's about profit. Okay, as much as it's about anything else, and I would say more than it's about anything else. Now, look, I'm not. I don't want to get into a conversation about like whether vaccines are on the whole good or not. But this is what I'm saying: is that this kind of thing undermines trust in yeah. governments and, and pharmaceutical companies because we look yeah. at this and think, this is deceitful. This is actually costing people's lives. And if you're lying about this, if you're deceiving people about this, if you're coercing people unethically about this, what else are you lying about? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the point I'm making is that this is not the way to build trust. And many people are losing trust in the pharmaceutical industry and in the, in the vaccine industry in general for this kind of reason i mean do you think that's a fair comment i think that's very fair and I, you know that, that's one of the reasons why you know coercion is, is isn't eventually going to backfire yeah um because, it is already i think it is already because it is already i mean yeah they shouldn't have done it uh, there's no need to do it as, as we've said there's no logical reason behind this sort of coercion because uh because in the end they, they, the vaccines are not designed to stop transmission they're not designed to um, stop that, or they haven't been tested on that at least. Um, they're designed to stop symptoms um, from being, being bad. And they seem to work at doing that. But that does mean that, you know, you could still catch and, and pass on COVID. Yeah. So the vaccinated person um, is, but, but luckily, you know, as we, as we know, Jamie, but as the country hasn't been told enough, um, you know, the chances of dying from COVID is, is lower than dying from the flu. You should treat it in roughly the same, you know, level of uh, yeah. risk uh, if you're under the age of 50. Yeah, you know, and as it happens, people over the age of fifty have all, if they wish to, been vaccinated now. Yeah. So why are we still locked down? There's no, there's no, there's no reason behind it. There's no reason behind certification. There's other than the government uh, yeah. keeping the power onto itself. And, yeah. You know, that's... Uh, yeah. Sorry, Tom. I didn't mean to interrupt. But what I was going to say is that this, this, this one fact puts a lie to this whole thing about vaccine passports, right? Is if if the vaccines don't stop infection or transmission, right? So if you have a vaccine. It may suppress your symptoms, but you could still get COVID and you can still transmit it, right? So if you have a vaccine passport, which allows you into a venue, you've been vaccinated, but that doesn't, that doesn't stop you spreading the coronavirus. So how does that make any sense? That doesn't make, that doesn't make any sense. And again, but, I mean, this, this kind of thing undermines public trust because you think this is completely illogical. You're telling me a reason for this, which doesn't make any sense. Therefore, there must be another reason which you're, which you're think, lying about. I think to be fair to the vaccines, they, they do seem to reduce t transmission. Um, uh, and that's, I mean, that's good. I mean, again, um, with, with the exception of the, the, the dubious eth ethical issues around rushing them out and, and, and the manufacture and testing of them, um, which do need to be thought about, um, you know, I'm not going to tell anyone how to make their mind up. And you need to think about them um, before taking the vaccine. Um, the, um, the, the, the whole rationale behind the not being able to open up or being able to open up is, is, is that the vaccines aren't really working, uh, but they seem to be. It's, it's really weird. You know, we've got, we've got models coming out saying vaccines aren't really working, so we need to stay locked down. Whereas, you know, this is, was they, they are by their own, you know, that, Tom, Jamie, I mean, it's, it makes no sense, does it? It's, it's all completely cockeyed. There's, there's no point entering into this narrative because this narrative you know, in the words of, uh, who is it? Was it Lewis Wolpert who wrote, oh no, it's, uh, <laughs> he's quoting actually, I remember, the uh, Alice in Wonder Wonderland. It's asking you to, to uh, believe six impossible things before breakfast. None of this stuff makes any sense. It's completely contradictory. The vaccine can't both work and not work at the same no. time, all right? This is, you know, this is double think. This is 1984 we're living yeah. in. You know, people have to start using their brains and, yeah. and, and start applying some critical thought. If the vaccine works and people, who have and people want to take the vaccine to be protected, they can do so, then we should be able to open up. If the yeah. vaccine doesn't work, there's no need for vaccine passports and we need to come out with some other solution to how we're going to live because we can't live like this no. indefinitely. And Sumption makes that point in an article in, in the Telegraph. Yeah. Either this works, in which case we, we, we should be unlocked, or it doesn't work, in which case... We can't stay locked down. Yeah. But I mean, the only thing I would challenge you there, Jamie, is, is, is that I don't, I'm uncomfortable 
with, with that sort of argument, simply because I don't think our freedom should be predicated on, on enough people taking on a, a, a medical uh, um, procedure. You know, we, 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 shouldn't, we shouldn't be unlocked because vaccines work. We should be unlocked because we have an inherent right to freedom yeah. that the government shouldn't have taken away from us to begin with. Um, I agree. I agree. And, they, uh, they, they should never, ever have implemented a Chinese communist style lockdown in the first place. And the whole thing needs to be rejected. Otherwise, we'll never, ever get out of this. I'm just saying that according to their own logic, what they're own saying. Logic. Yeah, absolutely. I get, I get that. But t too many sceptics keep falling into this sort of, oh, well, you yeah. know, the, the, now the vaccine's working, we should be free. Well, no, because well, what, what, what about the next one? Are we going to wait for enough people to take the flu jab in order to get out of, you know, next, no next winter? I, I've, got no, I've got no time for that. And I don't want to get into a semantic argument here, but I don't think you can call yourself a sceptic, really, if you're thinking that way. Because you're, no. all you're doing is collaborating with this ideology. This ideology is false. It's evil. I believe it's a work of darkness. Yep. And the whole thing must be rejected wholesale. or We will never, ever get out of this. It's like, you know, it's like, and I have a lot of sympathy, right? Because I, I've been reading about the 1930s in Germany recently. So I, I do understand that, you know, it's hard. It's hard to work out what's going on when you've got a regime uh, in charge that are essentially being deceitful. It's hard. It's hard to get to the point where you say, well, you know, um, this, this thing is evil and it needs to stop immediately. You know, it took a long time for people to come to that conclusion in, in 1930s Germany. And even during the war, there were lots of um, decent people who, who didn't really understand what was going on. But I would draw an analogy here, and I'm not saying it's as bad, although I think it's got the potential to be as bad, uh, with, with Nazism. You know, the whole ideology is evil and wrong and anti-human and it needs to be rejected. People are not just bags of chemicals walking around, potentially infecting each other. We are valuable, we are worthy of dignity and respect, and the ability, we should be given the ability to be free and to form normal human relationships and to see our family members and to access education and to start businesses and to do everything that hu free human beings do, regardless of whether or not there's a virus around. This whole ideology reduces human beings to bags of chemicals, as I say, potentially infecting each other. And it's an absolutely demonic way to think of humanity. An awful binary of either COVID or non-COVID. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's awful. Yeah, um, we, may, we may be about to see the, the final manifest or, what, you know, a, a, a very significant manifestation of this ideology of these vaccine passport ideas come to fruition, as they already have to well, we can, in Israel. We can only hope that our, our government and well, our, our government will turn away from it as, our, as the letter asks. Our parliament yeah. will reject it. Um, yeah. And That's of course, great. all, all who, who, um, who, who, um, who have faith, who listen to us, you know, pray uh, earnestly. Yeah. Amen. Um, Amen for our freedom. Amen. Write to MPs, tell them you're not going to put up with this. Tom, do you want to hear something absolutely outrageous? Go uh, on. Somebody has sent to me. Now, this is, I hasten to add, this is not the email of the week, although I, I, I just I couldn't resist um, sharing this. So somebody sent me uh, something from a Baptist quarterly today, right? right go on. Written by a man called Richard Bott, who is the moderator of the United Church of Canada and shared under a Creative Commons attribution non-commercial license or something anyway um it's called a prayer as i put on my mask and it goes like this creator as i prepare to go into the world help me to see the sacrament in the wearing of this cloth let it be an outward sign of an inward grace a tangible <laughs> way of living love for my neighbors as i love myself i haven't made this up right this person has just said that putting on a mask is a sacrament that is blasphemy Right, let's continue. Christ, since my lips will be uncovered, sorry, Christ, since my lips will be covered, uncover my heart, that people would see my smile and the crinkles around my eyes. Since my voice may be muffled, help me to speak clearly, not only with my words, but with my actions. Holy Spirit, as the elastic touches my ears, remind me to listen carefully and full of care to all those I meet. May this simple piece of cloth be shield and banner, and each breath that it holds be filled with your love. In your name and in that love, I pray. May it be so. May it be so. I mean, I don't, I don't even know what to say about that. I think that this person, I don't know. I just find that to be deeply strange, Jamie. It's deeply strange. I mean, what can you say, Tom? Comparing it to a sacrament is is, is weird. I mean, you know, blasphemous. it's blasphemous. It's, it's blasphemous. I mean, you know, um, I mean, they don't really compare. They they, they asked that it might be a sacrament, don't they? Which is 
which is a str strange. You know, there, there are two sacraments, uh, and the Lord gave them to us. Wow. Uh, and one, they did not involve face masks. Um, the, the other thing is, of course, that, that face masks, are, we sort of touched on this, they, they deny essential humanity. Yeah. They deny essential humanity. They, they, they render us into infector or infected. Yeah. Uh, they, they, you know, would Jesus wear a face mask? I very much doubt that he would ever even conceive of wearing a face mask. Um, because, you know, Jesus, Jesus went to the lepers and, you know, embraced them or, or touched them. Touched, he touched unclean people. Um, he, 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 you know, there's that famous you know, healing of the blind man in Mark. Where he spits on the floor and rubs his spittle mixed with the dust into the eyes. Um, he, he touches people um, who are unclean. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, that, and that sort of tradition of going and being with the unclean is with Christianity throughout. Yeah. Um, I think, I think uh, one so of the worst things about face masks is how, how they kind of um, homogenize everyone. They sort of make, mm. you, they make everyone look similar. Now, obviously, like yeah. you can wear your hair differently and so on, but basically they have this, they have this um, net effect of reducing the individuality and in the way that people look, appear. And again, this is another, this is another tactic that, that communists um, and fascist Jews, which is to try and break people down and take away their individu individuality. So I mean, there's a famous, there's a famous picture of um, Guantanamo Bay. They use face masks, didn't they, um, to, to dehumanise people? Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's an important part of our communication. Our mouth, our smiles, our you know, yeah. the face of God is a metaphor used, and probably stronger than a metaphor. You know, again and again, sort of, um, you know, I just think. Um, this person to be very misguided. I think they're to be very misguided. I think that they're not seeing that, um, at, at best, I think they're putting a positive slant on, a, on, on what I hope is a negative thing. So I, I hope no one enjoys putting a mask on. It doesn't, uh, sound, and I, it doesn't sound negative uh, to me. It sounds like this person thinks it's some kind of spiritual activity to cover his well, I mean, the other thing, of course, is he, he seems to think they do anything. Yeah. He seems to think they do anything. And there's obviously, you know, we've spoken about this, but there's no good evidence that face masks do anything to viruses. No yeah. good evidence. Yeah. There's, there's a load of modelling studies, uh, which are um, as good as modelling studies ever are. They're, they're, they're basically the result of the assumptions of people modelling it. There's, there's a couple of modelling studies that actually show they make it worse because they nebulise bigger particles. Um, but generally speaking, you know, the, 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 the Danish face mask study showed they did nothing for the, to protect people. Um, and they didn't rule about whether they protected other people, but you know, um, they don't come on, Tom. They, and, don't, they don't do anything. We don't even need studies to, to show that. If they did something, we would have all been wearing them in the first they lockdown. They don't do anything. They, they, we would have been wearing them in the first lockdown. They, they introduced them after, when, when was it, in, in May or June, after the first uh, wave of the pandemic was over in order to um, spread fear through the population. They don't, they don't do anything. Our friend James, um, who is an, an engineer who knew about these, th who knows about these things, um, said to me, and I think I've said this on the show before, that they're anatomy, this, this, uh, the particles in this virus are a nanometer across. They are too small to be caught. Tom. Jimmy, you're back. Yeah, Hello. I don't know what happens. Hopefully, it's still recording, so hopefully that will be all right. Um, sure, sure. I was just saying yeah. that the virus particles, they're a nanometer across. Uh, the, 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 um, they can't be caught by, by masks. Masks do nothing. They're about social control. Even, even politicians like Des Desmond Swain have said this. Um, you know, we know, we know they don't do anything. So, um, you know, let's let, I mean, I appreciate what you're saying, Tom, that you've, you've taken time to look into it and everything, but, um, you know, there's, no, there's no evidence. Um, yeah, there's no, evidence. There's, no, there's no solid evidence. Um, the, the, I mean, the, the gold standard, the report, uh, given by the, um, uh, by, by the, uh, Royal Society, um, about this time last year, was May, actually, um, effectively concluded they did nothing, um, yeah. but then said we ought to be wearing them just in case, um, so there you are, just in case. Always well, stay. that's that's the thing, isn't it, Tom? I don't want to wear them just in case because I don't want to cover my face up. Um, just in case. Just yeah. just in case. I mean, I could I could just stay. I could just never even see any human beings ever again, just in case. You know, yeah. I could never go out of. That's um, when people behave like that. We used to call them. We used to call them hypochondriacs. I think now we talk about health and anxiety. But whatever term you want to use, we used to have a sane view of this idea that um, you know. We should just never do anything in case in case something bad happens. Uh, it's not how it's not how you live. I don't want to cover my face up. 
I don't want my wife, wife to cover her face up. I don't want my friends to cover their faces up. I don't want my children to have their faces covered. I think it's de dehumanizing. I think it's I think almost certainly way more unhealthy to not be breathing fresh air and have all this this filth, you know, all your all your spit and everything right next to your mouth and 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 nose, all the snot, all the dirt that comes from from rubbing against your skin. I just think it's I think it's filthy and um and uh you know, I think it's completely contrary to any kind of um any kind of public health benefit so no thank you no and I, and yeah and just one more thing uh, which i know we've said is um to call master sacrament is uh is just total blasphemy and and idolatry and i think uh, i don't i don't really know i don't i don't really know how to speak in a way which is polite about that about about what that person has said but but that is just i i find that notion to basically compare that mask to our lord's body and blood by analogy um, I, th I think the I think grace. the analogy he's trying to make is a sort of uh, the mask to an inward grace, isn't it? A source of grace, but grace an is never inward sign of spiritual grace. Is yeah, so, so grace is never an outward, never, outward sign. Sorry, an outward. so so grace is never about dehumanising people, though it's about people reaching their full humanity. So that's a real problem there, isn't it? Because masks. Yeah, keep, um, uh, Jamie, I think we, we we need to hear the the email of the week because I've been waiting for this. Uh, this a moment you know, uh, well, to cheer us up. <laughs> well this is a really really good email and uh, i'm only gonna read out half of it which is called part one mildly enjoyable rant but it's basically from somebody who is um uh, a member of the church of england and um i can't remember whether she said she was okay with me sharing her name so i, I might just not share her name but um this is the email of the week so this is um this is mildly enjoyable rant and i'll do a dramatic reading here so I cannot tell you how bored I am with the church. Saying I am extraordinarily bored of it doesn't even come close. Every single person I encounter fills me with a sense of dread. I listen to them or their sermons, etc. This isn't somebody who comes to either of our churches, by the way. I listen to them or their sermons, etc. And as I tick off the woke-tastic bingo, I feel my soul dying inside. I haven't, in goodness knows how long, found anyone within the church who seems concerned with, oh, I don't know, worship, prayer, ministry, God even uh, it was then as you can imagine a joy to find you and your podcast yay i sit and listen and increasingly i don't do either of those things and see nothing of christianity in the church anymore each sermon harps on about climate woke tastic quotas and diversity anti-brexit whatevers and of course now covid covid is a gift to these people who in my opinion have become so politicized that they don't even realize they are spouting politics not love and most certainly not truth they have become so radicalized, they drone on in the most self-affirming, narcissistic manner that it honestly strikes me as a pantomime. It is vaudevillian. The COVID church is, in those terms, my favorite. I find it almost hysterical how much the church loves COVID. It is truly farcical. The taped off pews, the endless sanitizer, the excitable booking forms, and proliferation of links to some half-baked Christmas nativity puppet show, or some tweet Easter message, or Sunday morning play. I'm embarrassed for the church and the people in it who run it, in inverted commas. They have forgotten who they are, why they exist, and what their purpose is. They have abandoned the people, the flock, in favour of COVID and its self-affirming authoritarian vaccine-inducing way of life. Salisbury Cathedral merrily lining up some faux NHS doling out these diabolical vaccines, all for likes, clicks and optics. General word, dreadful word, but you get my sense. And worse, the church acting like the hurt victim when they willingly went above and beyond the measures suggested by the government way back last year. Each church has willingly submitting, um, sorry, each church has willingly submitted to the bishop's will. Men, men who run the church like a business, a corporation, a sinful capitalist enterprise. They have negated the entire population's thirst for goodness and faith when they should have been leading the way, offering solace and comfort. The church should never, ever close its doors. The church has abandoned its flock. COVID Sharia has claimed the church and it is merrily embracing uh, it and its next fancy climate Sharia. Um, I'm going to miss the next paragraph out one local vicar i know alienated his entire congregation by facebooking wokeism ramona comments all the time the new vicar a weak armed woman seems to be completely incomprehensibly terrified of any and everything where is the charisma where is the joy where is the love for christianity for the church for its buildings its statues its past and its future where is the love of the truth of our heritage of prayer of psalm of singing singing yes where is the love of singing for our souls let us hope this storm passes soon and that the sun will rise again. Anyway, enough ranting. I hope you enjoyed this little slightly playful rant. I think it is shorthand enough for you, having listened to one or two of your podcasts now. 
that you will understand my orientation. Um, and I'll leave it there. I should also say that this was a woman who wrote this. So um, just, just so you know, that's not um, some kind of patriarchal thing when she, when she referred to the new vicar being a, a weak armed woman. Uh, but that was a fantastic rant, I thought. Tom, did you, did you enjoy that? I, I enjoyed it. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I just, you know, I, I don't even know where to start sometimes with, with some of the things. I mean, we're lucky uh, that, that in my church we've avoided some of the things that she mentioned. Um, and um, I'm, I'm glad for that because otherwise I would have had to stop going. <laughs> and, uh, um, but, you know, um, well, I, did, did you see that we, we, were, we, were, we had a, the honour of a sketch by Bob Moran? Yeah, um, yeah. The, yeah, we haven't again. even mentioned and, this. We haven't even mentioned it, and, and it really shout out well to Bob this. Moran. Thanks, Big Bob Moran. Out, thanks, because um, uh, you know, um, really pleased uh, to, to to make that. You know, that's Amazing. a highlight of, uh, um, and um, you know, with, with, the, with the church, you know, connection lost. Uh, I think that's it. You know, um, connection lost. Uh, they've they've tried. Um, <laughs> they've they've got their Wi-Fi buggered up. You know, excuse my French. <laughs> something's gone wrong. Uh, they've lost the connection with the public who served them, um, and yeah. that's sad. Um, yeah. And I, I'm not sure quite where to go. Well, well, I think what we need to say, Tom, is is that you know, in in all seriousness, I mean, we can complain about woke tastic bingo and stuff like that, but what we need to do is we need to actually start preaching the gospel and teaching the scriptures again. Jimmy, I, I very, do very, that. You know, very, don't get me wrong. <laughs> very, very simple. Very simple. Start preaching the gospel and teaching the scriptures. Go to the start scriptures, with, well, that's, do what start, they say, and preach yeah. them. Go on. Start with, in, you know, in, in bringing people into a love of God's word. Uh, you know, that's a start point, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Amen. Um, Amen. You know, in, in, and, 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 and the wonderful sort of double nature of the word, you know, the logos, you know, the word of God and the word, um, the, the, you know, in Christ, uh, as Christ. And then um, the word of God is given to us in the scriptures, both of those. Uh, yeah, need to be. You know, we need to love them. Yeah, uh, people don't love the scriptures, Jamie. You know, are you going they to, don't, you going to they don't love the this scriptures. Yeah, they don't love the scriptures, Tom, because they don't like what the scriptures say, and they'd re hard. They'd, prefer, they'd prefer to talk about things like climate change. That's that's Jamie. Awesome. You know, Jamie, you know I, I was thinking once. I was thinking once about uh, an Easter sermon, an Easter Sunday sermon I heard. I won't say where it was, but it was in a Church of England context. And basically, it was Easter Sunday, and the message was uh, the resurrection is really great because it shows us that one day there won't be any more pollution in the oceans or climate change. You know, that was it. Nothing. No yeah. mention of resurrection. No mention of Christ. No mention of the new heavens and the new earth. No mention of Jesus's lordship over all creation. It was just like, oh, isn't it so bad that the that the oceans are polluted when it be good when that isn't the case anymore you know i mean i i mean it's, it's shocking isn't it um it wasn't you by the way no i know it wasn't me because um <laughs> my apparently my Easter service was too, my sermon was too heavy according to my wife but uh, what you did know, you say what did you say i said uh, i used jordan peterson I, i've got great I've, but you know, do you know he, he said um one of the most remarkable things he's uh, he said uh, i'm not sure what was it let me just get the quote right it's something along the lines of um I don't know what I would think, you know, I, I'm scared that this might be real, yeah. but I'm not sure quite how much, um, how terrifying it would be, you know, what, how much it would change if yeah. this was actually real. And I, and I challenged my congregation, because yeah. uh, I, I think it's, you know, Easter um, is interesting. We had the reading from Mark this week, uh, and the reading from Mark ends with them running away, afraid yeah. and silent. Yeah. Uh, and, and I said, you know, where, where? How does this link with our with our you know expression of joy? Yeah. Um, and I said that I think in the in the heart of hearts, Jamie, we we we, we, we might tell ourselves that joy is an easier emotion than terror. Yeah. Um, to deal with. Um, but on, but on Easter Day, joy and terror need to go hand in hand. Yeah. Because like Christ, our Lord, died on the cross and was resurrected. Yeah. 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 And uh, this has shattered shattered space and earth. Yeah. Uh, in a way that is still playing out yeah and will continue to play out until the end yeah. of time amen yeah so I love that yeah and, and sort of re it reconfigures if you take it seriously like jordan peterson is attempting to do it sort of reconfigures the way you think about everything yeah, i mean you're, you're presumably you're quoting from that interview which he had with uh, jonathan mm. Pache. i think yeah. he said something like he, he described this idea of the narrative touching the objective and he said yeah. uh, i think i believe that but i don't know what to do with my belief because it astonishes me this is terrifying isn't it it's yeah. absolutely terrifying christianity is terrifying yeah um, if you believe it 
if you believe it, it's terrifying. Even so. even if you just believe it a little bit, you know, it's it's it should it should change absolutely absolutely everything. Everything, everything, yeah. and that's, anything that it touches. Tom, that 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 is really profound, man. You know, that sounds like an awesome sermon. I have to say, I, I I'm slightly disappointed. I didn't think of that. That's excellent. Um, Although we do use different readings, so I had a reading from John, so maybe I didn't have such a good reading as you. But that's a, that's a really really good, that's a really good sermon idea. Yeah. Um, um, anyway, through that. the terror, yeah. through the terror, we find joy because uh, because we embrace. You know, yeah. if we let ourselves see glimpses of the truth in our lives, and that probably yeah. is all that we can manage. Actually, Jamie, I think it, you know we only very rarely do we manage to, to experience the full um, the full sense of, of God uh, with us. Because, and and some people are better at it than others. But you know, in prayer, in reading, in, in worship, yeah. uh, you'll occasionally get glimpses. And because I think to allow ourselves to live fully in that light would be impossible as a human. Um, but that's the glory that's going to come. Uh, yeah. You know. And I, I quoted from C.S. I mean, the other person, of course, who's really interested in myths and narrative uh, is C.S. Lewis um, and his and, and J.R. Tolkien as well. Uh, um, lots I'm of sure people. Some, lots lots yeah. of people. <laughs> yeah. Lots of people, but you know, popular people. So I talked about yeah. that, that dark moment. I don't know if you know the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Where, yeah, well, yeah, where of, course, the, of course I do. Where, where they where they find Aslan's body on on the slab, yeah. and there's that confusion as the slab breaks. Yeah. You know that, that ponder, ponder moment of absolute terror. Yeah, uh, in the hearts of Lucy and Susan. Yeah. Anyway, um, absolutely, man. It's it's uh, it's a wonderful depiction of, of what was going on in the atonement, isn't it? I think the, yeah, um, it's great. The, you know, when he says to the witch uh, that she doesn't understand the magic that was uh, the the dark magic that was wrought at the beginning, or something like deep, that. Deep magic. Deep, deep magic. magic. Yeah, not yeah, dark. yeah, yeah, not dark. <laughs> not dark. But you know, darkness doesn't necessarily have to be evil. It could be something mysterious. But I take I take your point that I was technically wrong there. But uh, Tom, <laughs> it doesn't sound to me like I mean I'm sure sure Sarah knows what she's talking about. That doesn't sound uh, too heavy to me at all. I think uh, people need to be challenged. Uh, with the truth and the serious of the seriousness of the commitment to the gospel they're making i actually um i actually talked about the church invasion on on good friday I, in my sermon i i um, easter sunday i said that there is a uh, any law which is any power that is given to our earthly rulers is given by god to be uh, wielded in a way which is righteous and that there is a higher law than the law of man and it is the law of god and christ has proven that he is a higher authority than the than the authorities of this world through the resurrection through the resurrection jesus has shown himself to be lord and god and so he is he is the highest authority and when we have to choose between the state and god we choose god and that's that's the that's the choice which is open to us um, and which which we're going to have to make in in probably a more poignant and focused way in in the days to come so there we oh, are man. Yeah. there we are man there we are well, Look, tom this is this has been an awesome conversation i've really really enjoyed this and i think we should probably draw it to a close because we don't want to give people we don't want to give people too much do we because they'll i think they'll almost get overwhelmed at the intensity but um just to say uh, just a few things just to just to summarize um if you'd like to get in touch irreverentpod at gmail.com love your emails um we'd love to hear from you follow us on twitter at irreverent pod uh, support the show patreon.com forward slash irreverent thank you so much for everyone who's support, uh, supported us so far please keep going uh, so that we can expand and improve upon this ministry here and also if you are a christian leader either in a church or of an organization please go to www.vaccinepassportletter.wordpress.com and sign that letter against vaccine passports particularly as applied to the church if you're not a leader send it to your leaders and uh, whether you're a leader or not, write to your MP, write to them dot com or uh, um, the other one you mentioned. What was the other website, Tom? Quickly, it was. Uh, 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 right, they work for you. They work yeah, for they you. they work for you. They work for you. Write to them dot com. Go there. Write to your MP. Tell them no, 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 no vaccine passports anywhere at any time ever. We're not having that in our society. But that's it, basically. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, this has been. been it, we love we love our listeners. Like, I genuinely love our listeners. I mean, I've not I've not I've not met almost all of them, but I have such a. I just love our listeners, Tom. I just love hearing from them. It puts a smile on my face. It encourages me, and um, you know, we we're just so. We, I, I I mean, we're just so encouraged and and feel so supported by people listening and and getting in touch and downloading the show and sharing it around and saying positive things. You know, Tom, we we hardly ever get any negative comments, which I find absolutely astonishing our, our youtube videos they have either either they've got no thumbs down or one thumbs down but they've got they've got hundreds of likes so it's an amazing thing to to, to feel such positivity from people yeah. Amen. and of course if you are that way inclined do pray for us 
if you pray for us for our ministry and we pray for you and uh, be blessed everyone regardless of yeah. your you know so yeah happy easter christ is risen easter. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. That was the word that we were hinting at last year. Oh, yeah. last Alleluia. 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 Or hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. So all things are possible through Jesus Christ. So we hope that uh, for all our Christian uh, listeners that you, you have a blessed uh, Easter tide and that you feel Christ closely in your hearts and, and have wonderful times of, of prayer and, and fellowship with other Christians. And for those of our listeners who are not Christians, we, we love you too. Uh, we do hope that you find Christ and that you are blessed and you're always welcome to the show and uh, to, to interact with us and to listen and, and to be part of what we're doing here, regardless of, of, of where you are in terms of your faith journey. We just uh, say thanks to everyone. And yeah, that's it now. That's it for this week. Anything Thank else? Thank you Tom? very much. No, that's it. God bless all. All right. God bless everyone. Bye now. Bye-bye.